Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our success Thursday. And this week, we have with us Usman Kotval. Hi, Usman. Welcome back. Hi there. So, Usman, on Thursdays, we dive into what success means for us as Scrum Masters. Obviously, we need to keep our own scorecard and self-assess so that we can learn, which is exactly the same we advocate for the teams, right? Like self-assess, have your own scorecard, and then in every retrospective, discuss how we are going to improve. Of course, for Scrum Masters, that means we need to have those routines also, the questions we ask ourselves and what success means. So we'll dive into that. But before all of that, we do want to talk about retrospectives and the formats that you prefer. So share with us, what's your favorite retrospective format and why? There are a few ones I quite often fall back onto because I just really like them a lot. One is starting off with a with a good health check. Quite often, usually, if the team is new, it starts off as a very simple Spotify health check. And over time, it grows and grows into something more specific to the team. And use that as a starting point to then get into a sale board. Basically, what brings us forward? What are our drivers of success? And what is it that keeps us back? And from then on, either get into something akin to one, two, for all, where we uh, look into specific topics, or just take something else from the liberating structures toolbox, really where I try to make smaller groups where people have to first figure out it for themselves and then work it out together. This, I would say, is something in in a way that I do uh, rather often, which means something where it feels measurable, which is why I have the uh, health check. And with almost any idea, I have one point where people have to think for themselves, ideally without being able to see what other people are writing, to write it out for themselves. I would say that one is basic format is probably one of my go-to formats. Yeah, the one, two for all is a very important format in my toolbox as well. I remember when I learned that format the first time, I think it was it was definitely before I even knew Agile existed. Uh, and it was sold to me as a brainstorming format. Of course, later on, I used it for everything. And it starts from this idea, which you already alluded to, which is that when you give individuals time to think on their own individually, before they share and they listen to what others have to share, you first, you come up with much better ideas because there's more diversity. That's an easy one. But also you allow people who are very often silent and step back to actually bring their ideas forward and to be recognized for their ideas by their colleagues, right? Like, you know, you don't talk too much, but uh, in the retro, we use this one, two, for all. And you came up with the idea that we all wanted to converge on and and uh, and apply. So that those two key advantages, the diversity and better brainstorming, plus the ability to hear uh, the the lower voices, I think are, are key advantages for that format for me. How about you? All these things I fully agree with. There's one thing that always gets me, and that is this format is exceedingly simple. And when I heard it the first time, I was like, how did I not think of that myself? And I think that shows a genius idea that it seems so simple once you hear it, but would never, ever get to that idea in the first place. Also, uh, something I, I never thought about, but this is something you could use in friend, group, friend groups, for instance, really, too, to get to a conclusion. So uh, I think it's also incredibly, incredibly versatile. Yeah, absolutely. One, two, for all is a, definitely a great and versatile format for us to use. So, Usman, now we turn our attention to the role of the Scrum Master and all of the things we want or at least need to take into account when it comes to defining success. And here in this podcast, we believe that everybody has their own journey and everybody defines success in their own way. And we gain from that diverse perspective. So the question is for you, Usman, what does success mean as a Scrum Master? Let me start a bit a bit differently, but then get to the point afterwards. First of all, it starts depends on the, on the starting point of the team. And it depends on um, the role we have. And that as a Scrum Master, we are people who have a good feeling when it comes to processes. And uh, something I realized for myself is that process people, me as a process person, is, is a dangerous person. And that is, if I don't think there's enough to do, I might start inventing work, which is you know very detrimental, especially to, to the team. But I think less actually has it right on the money. And that is, once the team feels comfortable to a good degree, work should be focusing more and more on organizational change. 
for the Scrum Master. I think that is exactly a, a, a point that I think is, is, is really well in doing that one. So how do I define success? Now let's say the team is still very new. I actually have just several metrics, as in, uh, in, in the health check, what we have is, okay, how do you feel? Are, are you having fun? Do you feel like you're focused on the work? Are you fe- do you feel like you are empowered? And these kind of things. So that helps me assess the situation. And usually is something that that usually gets better over time. But uh, one of the biggest ones, I think, is that we as a team together try to figure out what are the product success metrics. And what I've seen is something that I didn't believe in the beginning, by the way. And that is that as a Scrum Master, you can play a vital role in good product impact. And that to me is the point where I want to be measured the most. Break that down for us. What do you mean? So. If a team is working on something and the team is feeling really well, but the outcome is not good, well, maybe something has been going wrong. It does not necessarily mean something went wrong because maybe the product was not right. Maybe there were some other things in the steps which which just didn't work out. Or maybe you just tried and, you know, it happened. But a good product that has been delivered in a good fashion usually does not come from teams that are not able to do so. It usually means that there are teams that are willing to communicate, teams that are willing to share ideas, teams that are willing to engage with customers and stakeholders. And a Scrum Master can play a vital role in making sure that team can get to that level. So having a successful product and maybe finding impact products, uh, impact metrics that the team then defines themselves is to me a good way of seeing that the work that has been done has been done well, especially if the team didn't start that well. And is that what you mean by like focusing more and more in organizational change, like shifting the focus from, you know, how we plan and how we measure velocity into how we assess if the product is having the impact we want? Yes. And more importantly, taking impact as one, not all, but one of the drivers of see, looking at organizational change in general, as in how do we set up the teams? How do we allow teams to, to form? How do we get to, let's say, a good alignment and taking successful products and the way we got to those products as blueprints to get to that? Not always, and I wouldn't just generalize it for everything because you always have to take it with, with a grain of salt because sometimes you just get lucky with a good product. Sometimes you uh, get there by doing overwork. And so taking all of these into account, and taking lots of quality metrics as in, okay, has been done without any overtime, has been done with people who feel like they are engaged and they like their work. That to me in combination is what shows, well, we are very much on the right track. Absolutely. And I like how you look at this from a holistic perspective, but starting from a very clear driver, this product impact, I believe is uh, how you described it, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what we are aiming for as a team is to bring in to the product something that has value, whether it is for the business, for the customers, for the stakeholders, or all of them, it's something that has value. And and also that brings us, I think from my perspective as a Scrum Master, it brings us a very key tool for us, which is the, the idea and the concept of purpose, right? Like what is the team trying to do? And it's not the, the purpose is not to write lines of code, which in some teams it ends up being, but the purpose is to have some impact that has value for a specific or a set of stakeholders. Absolutely. And I think it also gives something else. And that is, I think, a strong outcomes, increased trust with people you don't work with too often, maybe, for instance, with the management and such, which allows us to experiment more. And um, I think this is a a cycle which leads to more empowerment if you then play it right. Absolutely. That was a a great way to look at it. And uh, also, I think something we haven't very much reflected on the success question. So thank you for bringing that, Usman. My pleasure. Part of a successful Scrum Master job is to help the product owner. Tomorrow we explore that critical role in Scrum, the product owner role. Tune in to learn about product owner anti-patterns, what you can do to help the product owner, and a real-life example of what a great product owner is and what made it so. Tomorrow on our Friday product owner episode. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? 
share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.